Uh, okay, everyone, so we'll make a start. We're waiting on a few more people, um, but we will just uh, crack on. So, um, Roberta and I are in this room on our own, so at any point anybody can't hear us or see us, if you could message in the chat um, and let us know, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Um, so my coffee out of the way. Okay, everyone, so thank you for joining us for today's event. So I am Lauren Dempster, I'm a lecturer here in the School of Law, and I'm joined by Roberta Bacic, who curates the Complex Textiles Archive. And Roberta is going to say a little bit more about the archive shortly. Uh, so uh, we have, as some of you will know, a small exhibition of Complex Textiles in the Maclay Library here at Queen's currently. So there are four textiles on display there. And that installation was funded by the Human Rights Centre here at Queen's and as well as the Senator George J. Mitchell Institute for Global Peace, Security and Justice. So this event is, is linked to that display. Um, so Roberta is going to talk to us a little bit today about the role of textiles in truth telling and also um, Roberta's own experiences of working for the Chilean uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, so, Roberta, to begin with, could you say a little bit about the Complex Textiles Archive? Well, I think we have to talk about the two parts of the archive. Yeah. The material one, mm -hmm. the actual textiles per se, where they live, how they live, and how they have been put together. And the electronic archive that's hosted by Kay, the conflict archive in the internet from us, the university, that has really, with lots of patience and time and dedication, opened the possibility of archiving each piece in its photography, its narrative, but also through the exhibition. So the two things live together, not in the same space. One is in the cyberspace, the other is in different locations. But what makes the collection quite unique is the possibility to access all the pieces anywhere transnationally, not only by the groups we work with, but make it available for different institutions, organizations, and even groups of people who would like to start making textiles. So our collection has tried to really be a civic attitude to facilitate these processes. And in this moment, the collection has 377 documented textiles. So a piece to become part of the collection has to be at least placed on an exhibition once. It's only then that the piece is part of the collection. And also important to know that not all the pieces belong to us. A good number of them are ours and they come in different ways. Some have come from my own collection, but then of people who would like to give a secure future to the pieces they have, they donate, they facilitate, mm -hmm. and that's quite relevant because uh, that's the way a collection can grow. And the other pieces that we don't own are pieces that are given to us in care for long term, like uh, Oshima Haku Museum in Japan has a wonderful exhibition and collection of apilleras from Chile from the 1990s. So they have facilitated some pieces to get more visibility, tangible, in different exhibitions. And last, we have also pieces that we have acquired, commissioned or invited people to make them in response to certain exhibitions. Thanks, Roberta. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know, what, what is a textile? Like when we talk about complex textiles, what do we mean? Shall we show one? Yes, let's do okay. that. Yeah. OK. OK, so the camera is here. So if we point it at that, I think that's the way. Um, maybe like it holds it closer. OK, so we're hoping everybody can see this. So do you want to say a little bit about this, Roberta? Well, this is a very classical Chilean artillera, and artillera means originally Hessian, because the first Chilean artilleras were made in the 1970s during the dictatorship of Pinochet, and they were do, done out of potato sacks or of flour sacks, hence the name artillera. 
become a form of art. Now, if you look at them, they have the shape of a flower sack cut into four or six pieces, depending if the flower sack has 20 kilos or 30 kilos. And the reason they used it was what was available. No woman making them had access to buy materials. So they would have given, been given by different organizations flour, and after the flour was used, it was washed and made. And then the other characteristic it has, it has a frame, and it's done to make sure that this is not something practical, it's a picture. And I call them photographies of life, but it's also to show the human rights violations they live, but in the context, they could do their own responses to that. So they portray the reality they are living. Many of them were done at the time the events happened. Others are retrospective, retrospective of very important elements. Now in Chile, most of the arpilleras have the Andes, because Chile is crossed by thousands of kilometers of mountains, and that gives an identity and what I call also the landscape. Mm -hmm. The landscape that also gives you strength to feel who you are. In moments of human rights violations, you're, you are not empowered, you are disempowered, and so you look to things that make you strong, and one of them is the mountains, and the other is the sun. Many arpilleras are placed in the outdoors, although they were made indoors and they show experiences of activities they could perform outside and they put the sun and they contested the idea of the sun by saying that the sun is a political statement. It means that the sun shines for everybody and makes no difference. So from the very in, poor origins of the arpilleristas, the women who made them, mm -hmm. they were contesting things that we study now at university and we make theory. They did it from experience. They did not want what they called the kitsch of the sun to be beautiful. Yeah. The sun is something that happens to the oppressor and to the person who, who is oppressed. So here you have these, and also this arpillera would locate you and you would have to be able to read the codes of the textile mm -hmm. because you see this line and this line is showing you that they are placed in a poor shanty town where they had no access to electricity mm -hmm. and they are tapping. Yeah. So there are codes very interesting to read and layers that you don't get in a photography yeah. because it's the volume that also tells you that. If you look at this piece that is taken from the exhibition we have now at the Alster Museum following the footsteps of the disappeared. It's about the recovering of bodies at the end of the Pinochet era. So it's a very uh, early transition era, and you can see the bodies of the people very carefully represented that have been recovered mm -hmm. and they are wrapped in plastic. So one of the big dilemmas when you work in these issues is the relatives, the, the witnesses have an idea of a disappeared person mm -hmm. and they imagine they keep in the memory alive. Yes. They keep them with clothes, with the shoes the last day they were seen. And so in this representation, they dress the figures, although, of course, the people were not dressed like this. Yes. And for dignity, they cover with the nylon, the piece. So it's remarkable that the piece is over 30 years old and it has kept very, very radiant as it was. And the three dimensional idea of making the dolls that would represent actual people who were at the scene. Yes. So most of the arpilleras would also show the community strengthening the search for the disappeared, the people who accompanied them. Mm -hmm. And here we have the police car surveilling the operation. And then 
they have given the embroidery, which is not that common in mm -hmm. Arpilleras, it's quite special, and names, Talleres, that means workshops, FASIC, is the name of the organization that supported these workshops, supported the women to earn also a bit of money to be able to survive, because most of the people involved in the making had their husbands either disappeared or imprisoned or had to live into exile. So on the one hand, the women were denouncing, but on the other hand, charitable organizations were supporting their work mm -hmm. to, to be a, a breadwinner activity. Yeah. So that's uh, for you to have an idea oh. of a piece that shows you exactly the moment when the community is coming to be witness of the opening of this grave. Have thank you, Roberta. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that. So yeah, so for everyone who has just joined us, um, Roberta and I are attempting this sort of tech setup that allows us to be in the same room. So if anything goes wrong and you can't hear us or see us at any point, just put a message in the chat um, and I'm keeping an eye on it, so I'll hopefully see. Um, so thank you, Roberta, for that introduction. Um, you talked there about, you know, the origins of these textiles in Chile under the dictatorship. Can you say a little bit more, I guess, in broad terms about the role of textiles in truth telling and particularly what that meant in the context of dictatorship and repression in, in Chile? Yeah, there are different things to, there are different layers to your question. On the one hand, the important thing of the textile is that it allows the women to sit together and talk about their experience in a non-confrontational way. You are not looking at their eyes. You are not being asked questions when you are very unsure of what to say. You don't have to shout. You don't have, so your emotions can be dealt by an action. And the action is the stitching. All the Chilean artilleras would be very proud of saying they are all stitched by hand. There is no sewing machine. So every stitch that goes in then goes out. And while you're doing it, you're having an inward reflection and are starting to activate a way to express it. When the words are not enough to express the void, the pain, the anguish, the loneliness, you look for a way in which you can touch it. You're almost touching that reality. It also gives you the, a bit of time. I call it a bank of time because it's the bank, the time of the experience, the time of processing, the time of deciding what will I say, what will be the context and the actual material time to make it. So it's not that you can change your mind tomorrow. Mm -hmm. It's something that you have been going through over time. And the collective idea of sitting with other women, quite often with similar experiences, or women and sometimes men too, who would support them, is very rewarding. I am not alone. It's not addressed to me. Mm -hmm. And they become very political because they realize it's not a repression to yourself or to your son or to your neighbor or to your friend. It's an institutional thing that is happening. So that comfort also of you being an actor of your own story, if you know that the state will not publish what is happening and will deny it, you do what you can. And if what I can is to do that, I will sew it and put it together. The women who started making them did never ever think that they would become really so strong. It was more the agency they had, the people who acquired them, brought them out of the country that took risks to take them out and then to promote them internationally, to also say internationally what was happening. We have to say that the origins are very modest. Mainly they started in the shanty towns of Santiago and other provinces of mm -hmm. Chile, it then became almost like an art form. But at the beginning, it was very, very much a grassroots movement. 
Thank you, Roberta. I find it interesting what you were saying about the textiles not involving words. I was reading an article the other day that cited the work of, I think it was Lawrence Langer, and he writes about the Holocaust and how like we can't capture horror or can't capture pain in words. Do you think that's part of the value of textiles is that we don't need to use words to tell stories? It's it's very important what you say. It's also what Primo Levi said that we have to really discover a new language because the words in the dictionary don't capture the horrors of the lived experience. You can't translate, you can describe it, mm -hmm. but the lived experience at the level of emotion and loss of dignity, or that in his book, Is This a Man? He says, you had to invent another language. And we took the risk to try to not invent a language, give textiles the name of textile language to be able, because you also, it's so material. We, there are two things we have to do every day in life. It's to dress, to cover ourselves in bed, to dry ourselves when we take a shower, and to eat. So these everyday actions that remind us that we are alive are the means by which we can tell a story. It's the routine to make it the idea that you, in these times of so difficult, when you only had possibility to go to the prison to visit, thinking about the Arpillera we have at, at Queens, mm -hmm. um, the day of visit, you went once a week to visit your family, the, the relative, but what else could you do every day to remember the person is to sit down and stitch for a while, to be in peace with yourself, articulate and quite often it helped women to articulate what they would say in court or what they would say to a lawyer, uh, adjourn to them. So I think those elements are extremely, extremely important to take into account. And it's also because it's very common that we touch ourselves. Mm -hmm. So the idea of close domestic feeling and that the people who suffered the disappearance or are imprisoned and their relatives are human beings like us mm -hmm. that need to eat and dress like us every single day. Thank you, Roberta. I wanted to ask you specifically about the material that's used. So I'll pull up an example. I wanted to talk about Hernan's memory box. So oh, yeah. I'll, I'll share the screen. So one second, everyone. Um, So this is um, a textile called Hernan's Memory Box. So I'm going to ask you to say a little bit about this textile, Roberta. But I guess what wanted, what sort of prompted me to include this textile in our talk today was that with incorporating pieces of fabric in the textiles, it gives people scope to incorporate things that actually have meaning to them and to their loved ones. So could you say a bit more about that in terms of what that means in their truth telling function that they can actually use items that, that belong to people. Yeah, I think there are different elements to that. Mm -hmm. If we think of this piece that was commissioned by Conflict Textiles to Anna Slatkes mm -hmm. uh, for the exhibition following the footsteps of the disappeared, was the idea to engage with the relative of a disappeared person and try to ask them if they could give us an object a real object, textile material used by the brother of the, of, um, of the person who disappeared. And in the process, the mother is alive. The mother is 84 years old. The mother had struggled all over the years in Argentina. It's from Argentina, this piece, knowing that she had the, the, the bandage her son had to wear because he was um, handicapped. He had had an accident. So at the time that he was arrested, he was using this bandage. And the bandage was for her a memory of the pain the son already had and who was going to be able to give him bandages when he was arrested. She always thought he might come back. So in that process, when we asked for the textile, we thought we would get jeans, 
or where we get the tie mm -hmm. or a jacket and we got the bandage. And I think it's interesting to share with you and the people who are with us that the, these layers of textiles have other layers that are not there, not even in our archive. And it's, for instance, the fact that the artist and Aslatkes at the beginning could not bear having this bandage in her hand. She didn't know what to do with it because she probably had the idea of representing a person. And so it took over one and a half years to, of conversations, monthly conversations on how to do this without cutting it. My idea as a curator was it shouldn't be a conceptual idea that we have included a little piece of the bandage. Mm -hmm. It was important that you who see it know that it was a real bandage that covered the body of a person. Because textiles also have the double meaning. It's to comfort you, but it's also very much used for humiliating you. So people in prison are obliged to use garments that are there to humiliate them, mm -hmm. or they are tortured with a bandage over their eyes. So this idea was to be able to work it out. And as the brother of the disappeared ha is a lawyer, he had presented his case to court. So we thought of using the um, the text mm -hmm. of the Abeas corpus that was presented in court. Mm -hmm. So the idea of the box was to be able to put the two things, mm -hmm. the actual bandage, put the time when it happened, but also do what we do afterwards to reclaim the body that has not been found. In reality, we don't, there is no possibility of finding Hernan because he was thrown into the Plata River, so mm -hmm. his body will never be found. But the mother at least knows what we call in the, the final destiny of the son. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Roberta. Um, whilst we're doing screen share, I'll bring up another textile. So I know obviously that the focus of our conversation has been on Chile, but I wanted to, to show our audience the um, yesterday, today, the textile mm -hmm. from Peru. Um, so this is the one that was used in the Truth Commission, is that right? It was used, yeah. yeah. So um, so yeah, can you say a little bit about the, the role of this textile in, in the Peruvian Truth Commission? Yeah, this is a very interesting piece. It's quite big, mm -hmm. very different in size yeah. to the Chilean arpilleras or the arpilleras the Peruvian women make. But they, they were all women displaced from Ayacucho area to the capital Lima. So when the times of the Truth Commission happened, they wanted to represent what had happened to them. Mm -hmm. And they could also show that there was not so much difference between them. It didn't matter if they were victims of Shining Path or the state, because they were lonely women, displaced women, impoverished women. So they wanted to show their commonalities and the situation in which they were. They really did not want uh, to give testimony in Spanish mm -hmm. and be translated by a translator they didn't know. So it was mixed, but at least they had this, they made this arpillera that shows yesterday how they envisioned their past and how they lived in the countryside in the, in the Andes, mm -hmm. surrounded by their own produce and little animals, and how now they live in the city mm -hmm. in cement and very different surroundings. Now, what was very interesting about that is that they decided to stay a full day on the streets mm -hmm. in front of the courts. So at least they presented their testimony in public. And this piece is now, one of these pieces is at the Museum of Memory in Peru, oh. can be seen. So it's very powerful, mm -hmm. the idea of women finding their own voice and mm -hmm. encouraging people to say, 
to see that it's not only about the disappeared person, mm -hmm. it's how the social tissue of the whole family, community and country changes. Lima is a very poor city, and now we have more poor people coming to the city instead of encouraging to keep to stay and educate their children in the mountains. So yeah. those elements are very poignant. But as you are mentioning different countries, we mentioned Chile, then the bandage of Hernan from Argentina, this from Peru. I'd like to mention the carpets from Afghanistan. Do you want me to bring them up? If you want, because now that we are speaking about truth recovery, yeah. When and because Afghanistan has been so much on the scenes, uh, yeah. If you look at this carpet, unfortunately, it's not the wonderful photo, but it shows the way people in a in a little village saw the attacks coming, mm -hmm. and they had no mobile phones at the time it was made. They had no way to register that but by memory. So because carpets are so famous in Afghanistan and men and women weave together mm -hmm. and sell it to the tourists, they started to do these carpets and suddenly a war a photographer discovered the potential mm -hmm. that they should not be only for the tourism mm -hmm. agency and for them for a good, uh, to the subsistence, but it should go to be a testifier of what kinds of guns were used, what kind of armor vehicles that could really be able to denounce from where the attack came. Because quite often they said, we don't know, yeah. we were, it was not us. But the memory had them. So you see, this is a Kala, I don't know how to pronounce it, but what, from mm -hmm. where the guns were. So these were Russian guns, mm -hmm. and then who was using it. So it's quite interesting, the power of the testimony. Because there is a testimony, mm -hmm. and it's almost a photography. And if you see the size, it's the impact it has, because it has no sense of um, aesthetics. Yeah. It's what this gun did intervened my whole life. So if you see the gun is bigger than the helicopter. Mm -hmm. So this element of being able to stress the impact through the way you conceive, and it's not studied, it's spontaneous, yes. it's what you do. And quite most of these were made by men. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Roberta. That's a really powerful example, I guess, of what, what these tech tasks can, yeah. can do. Um, thank you for that. I'll just I'll stop sharing the screen now so that we're back on camera. Oh, I'm, I'm not on camera. Um, so I wanted to, to move on, I guess, Roberta, and ask you a bit about your experience of working for the Chilean TRC, just so we have some time for discussion at the, at the end of our, our session. Um, so could you say a bit about, I guess, first of all, which of the truth commissions you, you worked for and how you became involved in that work? Yeah, it's a, it has taken a long time of my life mm -hmm. because although I, I worked for the second truth commission, what we call El informe sobre, yeah, it's the qualification of cases, and it was corporation or national corporation of reparation and reconciliation. Mm -hmm. This was a commission, the second commission of for truth, mm -hmm. that came immediately after the truth commission that was set up in 1990. Okay. And the relevance of this commission mm -hmm. was to study the cases that could not be finished on the first because the first lasted only nine months. Mm -hmm. And what it did was very significant was to acknowledge what had happened. That was the biggest mission and collect all what NGOs and churches had collected of human rights violations. Mm -hmm. So the archives of Vicaria, the archives of, of the journalists who trusted the Truth Commission passed it all on. Mm -hmm. And with that evidence, hundreds and hundreds of cases could be qualified, mm -hmm. but many could not. So if I remember well, I had yeah. lent you the English, version. The, yes. the English 
version of a shortened version of the report that's three volumes mm -hmm. that has at the end the lists of the victims so what i used to call the list of the shame of my country because you go pages and pages in which each person is at least identified the age the profession and the date the person was last mm -hmm. seen or the day the person was abducted so this this um, this commission said that they couldn't finish their task right. and they suggested and created a law and put to, to the institutions to create a law mm -hmm. by which a new institution would be created to, on the one hand, study the unfinished cases, receive new denunciations, but at the same time would start to implement what they call reparations. So it was a very specific mission mm -hmm. that initially was going to last two years, but it lasted four full years. And some of the people in the first commission had been in, had joined through a very open system of applying to jobs. Mm -hmm. But for many, it was the first experience in front of human rights violation. And for many lawyers and social workers, it was very distressing because although they knew about these things, they hadn't really talked to actual relatives and survivors and gone to the courts. So for the second, that had to do also with reparations, there was a set of commissioners that was set up by the government, but then many relevant figures of, of Chile looked for people who had worked with the grassroots to do the actual on-site research, to go and talk to the people. And for that, you needed trust building. Mm -hmm. So when we were talking the other day about up to down or down to up, yeah. it's an encounter of the down to up and the up to down to understand. There is no such thing only to study it in the papers. And there is no such thing that you can take it all from the testimonies that also change over time. Not because you want to change them, it's for the lived experience. So when I came to work for the Truth Commission as an assistant of the research, they invited me to work under the suggestion of the Association of Relatives of the Disappeared and a bishop in Temuco, in the south of Chile. And so the, the Corporación had one main office in Santiago and one in the south. So I lived there and I lived in the areas and I could go and visit people who had suffered, people who survived, but I also had the task to interview perpetrators. So it was all in the area and that was very, very powerful because the difference, I had worked with uh, different organizations in my free time or my more social time and I had given a course in human rights. So all that was more or less at the same time. Mm -hmm. But with the relatives, you needed a time to to discuss that and explain them that this time they would believe them because they had so many bad experiences. And the experience with the Truth Commission really also opened many doors mm -hmm. because for the first time you had access to files, public files. You could study if a person had a death certificate. You could access and see if the person had moved to another country. So. It has limitations, but it also has access to information that is very different than you had when you were an NGO and you could just rely on first hand testimony. Thanks, Roberta. You mentioned there that a lot of the people you spoke to obviously hadn't been believed by the state for so long. How difficult was it to build up trust to, to sort of get them into a position where they, they felt that they could speak to you? Well, most of the people who really came to speak, came to speak about the impact of the events in their life. Mm -hmm. They really needed to be heard. So what was extremely powerful with the work we did at the Truth Commission is that we're given the space and the time 
to listen to people. Mm -hmm. So we took one hour, two hours, the time that was required for people who didn't want to come to you. We went to them and we listened to them, even though sometimes the notes you could make about the actual event were very few. Mm -hmm. But the power of them being heard was in itself a very positive exercise. It's a very costly exercise because it's very difficult to get to the rural areas. It's very uh, difficult to have enough staff to do it. But the benefits, even if two or three got it, then others went forward to also come and give their testimony, people who were not going to give it. So we had more people coming to give testimony than originally responses to the letters, because at the beginning the letters went to their homes, mm -hmm. but many didn't trust it, so they just destroyed it, ignored it, didn't respond or insulted it. But through that process, many started to come and make demands. Mm -hmm. Of course, we cannot respond to all the demands. We had to pass on. And what I found very valuable of the work we did was the to be trained to take testimonies in a very, I would say, empathetic way, in which we were very equalitarian to the person. And we could also write notes of reactions of the people that would have a very strong power in the decision making at the end by the commissioners if the case was going to be approved or not. So in one occasion, to give an example, you have many students who study law or are interested in the topic, a man, a man who survived torture, but his companion didn't. And asked about his experience, he just started to cry. And in that moment, we just put a note that he had told the truth and that he was certainly a witness. So we had no way to prove exactly the time or the hour, but his breaking down 15 years later was an absolute evidence of his presence there. So it was, as I say, a life-changing experience. Nothing I had studied at university or research taught me as much as the possibility of interviewing from bishops mm -hmm. to people in jail and then to be aware that a man who was qualified as a, a robber or thing, was a robber in a way because his father disappeared. There were two little brothers that stayed alone. The mother left. They were in the streets. They learned to survive as best as they could, and he became a thief. And then he had been so often arrested at the end, he was given a sentence for seven years. So his situation had an origin also that we had to understand that he wasn't a criminal per se. Mm -hmm. He was a person whose rights had been violated. And for him, it was extremely moving that a woman would come to see him mm -hmm. on his busy day and come to talk to about his father. So those experiences really justified very much the possibility of coming to the people not only the people coming to us. Yeah, thank you, Roberta. Um, so Roberta has uh, shared uh, some photographs from her um, time um, in, in working for the commission. So I'll share my screen so that you can you can see them. Um, So could you tell us a bit about this photograph, Roberta? Uh, about Blanca Valderas. She brings me a smile out because it's a life experience. It's a very composed photograph, you can see there. It's a photo I took in a visit with a friend, an anthropologist, when I decided to move to Europe in 1998. I had finished my work with the Truth Commission and uh, I went to see the families I had worked with from before the Truth Commission and through the Truth Commission. And I wanted to say I was leaving the country, I wasn't going to abandon the memories. And 
I wanted to see if they wanted me to write. And then we took photos. And this photo is very important because it shows her in her home mm -hmm. in Temuco, an indigenous area of the country. And she had been a mayor in uh, the times of Salvador Allende. Mm -hmm. So there was a big province that was too big and had too many very rich people who had lots of land and there were too many workers. So Allende divided the province and then gave a smaller piece of uh, place called Riachuelo and she was made the mayor of the town. So for wanting to install socialism and better rights for the workers. So on the day of the military coup, uh, she, her husband and all the workers in the, in the city hall or what mm -hmm. you call it, were arrested, were taken to the police uh, station and a few days later in sacks they were thrown into a river. She managed to survive and the photo is of her husband who didn't survive. So she survived and she opened the sack, she survived and she asked for help saying that she had a horrible husband who was running after her with a knife because she knew she said she was thrown into the river, she would disappear. Mm -hmm. So she had the intuition, very political. So for six years she lived hidden of the world, no access to his, her six children who were looked after by relatives. And when the situation was better, the Vicaria de la Solidaridad helped her to come back to her town and recover. The other important scene in that composed photo is the photograph at the back. Mm -hmm. That's the day she was given the, the post of being the mayor. And of course, this photo was absolutely banned from the place. Mm -hmm. So one of the tasks personally I took was to reinstate this photograph and place it back into the city hall mm -hmm. and give her a copy. In the process, she was a very active woman in the Communist Party. In the process of working out her life, she became very religious. So you can see the photograph of the Bible at the back. So we composed the photo with what we called the four pillars. Mm -hmm. Her husband, mm -hmm. her, her position that empowered her to be looking after the workers, religion that gave her strength to keep going, and flowers that she loved, and that we brought that day for her. So that's to understand the magnitude of the drama and how much it costs to bring people back. It's not just about money and the reparation. Mm -hmm. The reparation gives dignity. She could access to have a decent house yeah. after living in hidden and whatever. That's, but that's a minimum. It's mm -hmm. not a maximum aspiration. Certainly she would have preferred to have her husband and have a salary yeah. and to be responsible. But the reparations have a social significance mm -hmm. because every time as she goes to the bank to, to cash her check, she's treated as a person who deserves attention. So that is also important for education of the people who sometimes don't know how it works. Before she was treated like the wife of a disappeared. Yeah. Then she becomes Senora Blanca, mm -hmm. Mrs. Blanca. So that dignifies her and, and puts the different agents of society into interwoven uh, weaving textile. Yeah. What was her what was her life like when she returned? Was she able to sort of take on a, any sort of prominent role again? Or? No, never, never. She became very important for the Association of Detained Disappeared in mm -hmm. the south of Chile. Yeah. But she didn't go back to work mm -hmm. and she stayed very connected to her grandchildren and sons and, and the community. Thank you, Roberta. Um, 
I'm going to show um, another series of photographs that you took and then we can open the floor to yeah. questions. Um, so Okay, this is the first in this series. Yes, this is the series. Okay, so yeah, there's a series of, of three or four photographs here um, that Roberta sent through. So do you want to tell me about the significance of this picture? Yeah, we just spoke a bit about the arpillera of finding remains mm -hmm. of people. Well, this is from a town called Lautaro, 100% indigenous and has a little court, um, court uh, building and remains of four workers were oh, found. Sorry, I don't think it's sharing. Hmm? Um, it's not sharing with anybody else. <laughs> um, um, there we go, okay. Okay, so this picture shows after a week of working on forensic identification of four bodies, the recognition of one of the bodies. So the body of one of these um, workers is found in 1991. He had been disappeared in 1973, and the court decides to give the, the remains back to the family. Mm -hmm. I wanted to show how lonely it looks, how wet, like Northern Ireland a bit sometimes, yeah. and how distressing it was for the family to receive the body in a car, people who have no cars. Mm -hmm. So it was another imposition of the state, trying to be very uh, generous in the way to do, it wasn't their way. Mm -hmm. So they felt very detached of the process. And if you go to picture number two, you will see you will see the family mourning and you can see the background of the modesty of the house the coffin is so big that it was difficult to pass it through the door and it was a standard coffin that the, the commission would have bought mm -hmm. very good quality and wanting to do the best and not criticizing per criticism, but was not what would have suited them mm -hmm. the best. So the family is sitting around. And if you see in the next image, yes, that's the way they go to the final That's the way they really wanted to take their brother to the final destiny and to go into the earth. So they came with the oxen, mm -hmm. as you do it regularly, even today. So they go with their dogs and the community starts joining until the moment they get to the, their local cemetery. There's one more. Maybe. Yeah. It ends then. It, it goes there when local authorities start, start to join, but they have taken ownership of the event. So symbolically, it was very important to them. They directed how to do it, and then they let the public come. But they didn't allow the authorities to start from their home. And I think there is the last one where we see the brother putting the cross. Oh, this is the last one I have. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I forgot to copy it. Okay, it doesn't matter. So there is a last mm -hmm. photograph that shows the brother not allowing anybody else but him putting the name into the grave. Yes, so it's by taking ownership back. Yes, and to be able to be yourself. So you have to give people according to their needs. Mm -hmm. I used to say there's no point of giving, giving the same amount of money to the wife of the president than to a person in the co indigenous communities. They need land to mm -hmm. live. M money makes them again being um, different to the rest and being segregated by their own community. So 
giving compensations is very complex because there is no, the balance is only put in, you consider the person who receives the benefit. What is it what they really need? Yeah, thank you, Roberta. Um, and one, uh, one question actually, and then I'll open up to questions. I think in terms of what you said about the textiles and even what comes from talking about these photographs, I think it really shows how when we think about truth telling, like written testimony and verbal testimony can only do so much. Um, from your experience of obviously you worked for the Truth Commission in what the 1990s and since then you've been involved with, with conflict textiles for um, many years as well. Like, What have you learned about truth telling and the different forms it can take? Well, first of all, that there is not one truth. <laughs> and it's the work we do as we can and where we can to really unveil the situations that create the circumstances. There is no point only on giving reparations if we think today people are disappearing in other countries still. So, so it's not only to document it, it's how do we relate to these things and we get people engaged to act and maybe create more awareness and to also some agency that has an impact in law. Mm -hmm. If we think Chile today, the military are again in the province where indigenous people are. Mm -hmm. So what have we learned? It's not by repression that people will, will be able to participate. So more, uh, what I have learned is that there is not an end it's a life of dedication mm -hmm. and working with people the way they are mm -hmm. and doing what you can from wherever you are. For me, it was very important living far from Chile to be with the feet on the ground. And even though I don't, and now on top with COVID, you can't even go physically to continue mm -hmm. sharing the human dimension of what happened but the human responsibility we have in rebuilding and it's it's a responsibility of all of us because I think from the experiences from the Holocaust we also learned that we are not responsible only for what we do, we're extremely responsible for what we decide not to do and there is always something you can do even if it's small and the engagement in the issues and not accepting them but engaging and dealing with them, I think is the most important thing. And that a bit of truth is everywhere. I even learned, for me, it was very important in one occasion to go and take testimony to a military and to see how frightened he was of, or annoyed of being confronted by a woman who came to his house by invitation. So it was he really didn't feel at ease. He felt intimidated. Mm -hmm. And I felt because he was not used to have a one-to-one -one relationship. He wasn't used to have to talk about. He was used to give orders mm -hmm. and say yes or no. So once you see the other, you can start seeing how to act and how to operate. Thank you, Roberta. Um, uh, yeah, as you know, obviously I could talk to you all day, but I will um, open the floor for questions. So um, I invite people to go and see the exhibition at the Alster oh, Museum. Oh yeah, do you want to also. say? Yeah, do you want to Yo, say? at the end. Okay, cool. So um, yeah, if you have any questions, you can either uh, type them in the chat. Um, oh, thank you. So uh, Sarah said thank you. Um, the talk was moving, moving and beautiful. Who uh, said that? Uh, Sarah Feinstein. Feinstein. Oh, she had mm -hmm. to leave, unfortunately. Um, so thank you for that comment, Sarah. Um, so um, yeah, also if you have questions, you can just turn your mic off, Roberta, and I should be able to hear you if we've set everything up correctly. Um, so yeah, if you want to put your hand up or type a question in the chat, that would be great. Thank you. Want to ask a question? Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can. 
Hi, um, thanks so much for that presentation. It was really fascinating. Um, really interesting to have kind of the explanation of the textiles and as well seeing the photos and all this personal story. So thank you so much, Roberta. Um, I have a question. I have my arpillera behind me. I have an arpillera. <laughs> um, and I have a question um, about, in the Chilean case, the sort of source of the textiles and the art, because we know that in Latin America, for in indigenous women, weaving and textiles are really important. And you mentioned, Roberta, that the arpilleras a lot of them sort of came up in the shanty towns in Santiago, I imagine. So I wanted to ask, is there a debt to indigenous art amongst the arpilleras? Were they indigenous migrant women, some of them? Um, or, or I'm thinking about even American patchwork. In terms of what, what is the source of this um, arpillera art form? And, and are there any debts to either indigenous people in Chile or even American style patchwork? Yeah, well, there are different things. I would say the Mapuche people where I lived in the south, where there, there is a big population of Mapuche, not necessarily would have engaged in making arpilleras, mm -hmm. but they had, in their weaving, they would have rep represented experiences. But sometimes the testimony goes by over-representing your own identity. And I very often say it's been very symbolic to see that in this moment of all these social movements in Chile and the uprising of the people two years ago, they, for the first time in the country, they started to show the symbols of the Mapuche flag. Mm. So the collection has quite a number of arpilleras that were made by a woman who is very close to the Mapuche movement, mm -hmm. and they show different moments and situations of the Mapuche, like the hunger strikes and the way the truth process was looked for and the demonstrations, but it's also the use of symbols. How mm -hmm. much of this art and this weaving penetrates society? Sometimes I'm shocked to see that there is a culture now of making dresses with arpillera dolls. Mm -hmm. It seems to me absolutely <laughs> strange, but mm -hmm. it penetrates the different layers of society in which you start finding quite often the origins. So the colors also of the Mapuche textiles is also quite being represented in some of the arpilleras. Mm -hmm. And in the United States, there is quite a bit in the quilting, but mm -hmm. it comes also from the origins and the times of this of slavery. Mm -hmm. So because the black women were making quilts for themselves, but also for their owner, their owners, mm -hmm. in the time they were slaves, they would have engraved and stitched in messages and secret messages and done drawings that would give the person who received another message. So it's quite fascinating to see how it has gone into the layers. Of course. Thank you so much. Thank you, Claire. Uh, are there any other questions? Um, I'll ask one actually whilst our audience um, think of any other questions they have. One of the things I meant to ask you about, Roberta, was when I was reading about, I think it was this textile that we brought, that there was um, a letter in the back. Is that something that happened with, with there the textiles? Are, there are many arpilleras yes. that have a text. And one is the text of the very original arpilleras. There is one, I don't know if you can quickly yeah. look it up in our database. It's called, Where Are, Where are Our Children? It's a very, very poignant piece in which at the back was a very, very secretive pocket. It's from 1979. And in that hidden pocket, there was a claim of a woman of her circumstance. So it's very important that at the time when they started to use mm -hmm. it, they knew that these arpilleras would go. And they wanted whoever got it 
to know what was going on and it was a way of denouncing. It was an agency, but also was a desperate call. And in this one, it says a desperate woman from mm -hmm. Chile. Mm -hmm. So they also wanted to express their ask. They were asking for support, for help, for empathy and do something. It's a very poignant. I don't know if the letter is at, at the end. Oh, yeah. It might be. No, we don't have it there. Oh, uh, this represents our children? Okay. Yeah. Can you read it out? Yeah, so it says this represents our children where they are now under the eye of the Dina, political secret police, while we, the mothers, cry to one day hear about them, uh, an anguished mother in pain, Chile, 1979. So the very powerful thing also of these little notices where how they were taken, then done, they tore a little piece of school scrap of paper yeah. and wrote and hid them. So I had this arpillera for four years before I found this, this okay. scrap of material yes. because it was dyed, so mm -hmm. it was like a stain. And then suddenly I realized that there was a letter and the letter was read almost 14 years later. Oh my goodness. So the whole culture of trying to... Uh, oh, sorry, uh, yeah, yeah. To, that's where they you see where the pocket is? Oh, is this it up here? Yeah. Oh my and then the other one is the letter per se. So I know, obviously, Roberta, you touched on earlier when we were talking about this textile, that textiles were used to, to sort of spread news of what was happening in Chile. How did that actually work? Like, how did they get the textiles out? Well, there were different ways. But the most common way was that through the Vicaria de la Solidaridad and FASIC, the Fundación de Ayuda Social mm -hmm. de las Iglesias Cristianas, these organizations exported them. So CAFOD, Amnesty International, mm -hmm. brought them into different countries. In England, there was a really good number of Christmas fairs that would have sold them and so people started to buy them and mm -hmm. it became quite common to do it this way yeah. and so it was especially in the uk france and the united states where they came and that was a way to legitimate but also to denounce and up until i would say 1980 it was quite openly sent away because mm -hmm. nobody noticed them and the military would have said that's just women's work. And if anybody sees them, who will believe them what they say? They have no voice. But it was actually a military attache that saw one in a place in an embassy mm -hmm. that he could realize the power of the arpilleras and they become became proscribed in Chile to make them, to sell them and you could be court martialed for that. But in those times, the system was already running, so yeah. there was more people willing to take them. I myself bought many since 1975, and when I wanted to send a present to my family in Europe or friends, I would send arpilleras mm -hmm. that I then asked back for the collection. Yeah. Oh, that's really fascinating. Thank you, Roberta. There is a question in the chat. Um, Okay, so Grace has said, you mentioned a museum in Japan that has a great collection of arpilleras. Which museum is that? And could you recommend any other significant collections that people might visit around the world? Well, Oshima Hako is a very small private museum. And it's very interesting because it's in the heights of the mountains. And it's in the memory of a famous poet called Oshima Hako, mm -hmm. and the family and the community where he comes from decided to create this museum. He was a local poet, and he translated Pablo Neruda's poetry into Japanese. And in Japan, there was a strong, small, small community, but a very strong communist community of intellectuals who would have supported the idea of socialism and empowerment. 
and they really decided to support the women of the disappeared and bought a number instead of giving them charity, bought them, brought them to Japan, commercialized them, and then eventually stopped selling because then you come you engage in another campaign. Mm -hmm. And in that process, they heard of an exhibition I had in Japan and through my colleague Tomoko Sakai, mm -hmm. who is an academic who did her PhD on the effect of the troubles in young people here in Northern Ireland. That's how I met her. Uh, they attended the exhibition and we went on a visit and we documented the 88 arpilleras they had. So from being there for testimony only and to have them in their archives, they are now part of the collection mm -hmm. and they are accessible there. But I have on loan, as I said, some of the pieces. This is a piece from them in permanent loan, so to be shown and accessible. So it's fascinating. Now, there are different collections. There is the collection of the Museum of Memory in Chile. There are collections uh, of arpilleras, but mostly they are part of exhibitions that are brought out occasionally. Mm -hmm. The Tate Modern in London has a number of arpilleras. I have given a couple of lectures and contributed with other topics that they don't have. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Roberta. I've just dropped the link into the chat um, place for the, the other events that, that are currently on and also past events. Everything is, is on the yeah. Conflict Textiles website. So yeah, I would encourage you to have, have a look there. Um, we have other questions. So so, so mm -hmm. just to say, any of you who is around can book a free ticket to the Ulster Museum and go to the Troubles and Beyond, and we'll see seven arpilleras, transnational arpilleras from Chile, Argentina, Zimbabwe, and Northern Ireland on the topic of the disappeared. So you can have a visit and you can go to Maclay yep. Library mm -hmm. and you can go to the McGee Library in Derry, where we have also a permanent display, rotating display. Yes, yeah, thank you for flagging the one at Miki, I should have mentioned that. So yeah, so if you're around Queen's, like between the Ulster Museum and, and Queen's Library, there's 11 textiles on display. So um, we have a question from Chris Boyle, who's one of our LLM students. So Chris says, I was curious about your experience in the Trist Commission in speaking with uh, perpetrators. How um, did you feel about doing that and how did you prepare yourself? Well, um, the only way you can prepare is by studying all the documents you have. Really, it was more than a viva, mm -hmm. more work than preparing my PhD, because you had to absorb all the information that you are not used in technical, in technical terms of what's there. But the Truth Commission has to be capable of reading what's not there. Mm -hmm. So you have the double task because you can declare a case for the lack of action in front of something that happened, for the denial of justice. So if a woman in 1975 goes to court and denounces the disappearance of her son who was abducted by police such and such because she saw him, and nothing happens, but on the other hand, from legal terms, 10 years have passed, so it's not chargeable. Mm -hmm. You have to have studied all the relationship between the ordinary courts and the mission of the Truth Commission. So really, there is never enough. I used to spend days and nights studying the case, putting myself in the position, and also finding the way to ask questions I learned that the questions were not good enough, that you had to more uh, explain and show what you knew and ask a yes or a no, mm -hmm. because questions were guiding and always allowed you a denial. So the biggest success for me was to go sometimes and show that I knew exactly and that even if they denied, they knew that I knew. It was a way to cope with the idea because in a truth commission, you can't oblige people to give testimony. You can only invite them. Yeah. 
if they don't come, you send the letter that you will come. They could close the door, but if they open the door, you don't know what's going to happen. So you prepare yourself just by knowing and by having visited the family or the site mm -hmm. and having done all the research you can. In some cases, it was quite powerful that we had managed to find um, evidence in hospitals. Quite often a forensic doctor would have stated that the person died of three bullets of that characteristic, so I had to go and find out what kind of bullets those were, and that could be much that it was police bullets and why they were there. So those are the kind of complicated things at the personal level. At the end of the day, we are just people who confront one to the other. The, and you learn to deal with that. In mm -hmm. one occasion, it was really interesting. I had to come in through a long corridor, knowing that maybe many people had gone there and not come back. Of course, I was going to come back because I was contracted, and, and I don't know why. But when I faced the man who was the, um, the lawyer in charge of, of responding to the Truth Commission, somebody was appointed, said, we are both paid by the same daddy. So I referred to that we were two public servants. Mm -hmm. Our salaries came from yeah. so that, but I hadn't studied that. It came of how to approach that we were at the end doing our job. Mm -hmm. So, and as a woman, it had advantages and it had disadvantages, but had quite a few advantages in the sense, especially for perpetrators, they are a bit more empathetic to women. Mm -hmm. Do you think they were more likely to just give you more information? No, no, but at least to be less aggressive. Yeah. Uh, that was less. And uh, surprised, a surprise for them. Mm -hmm. Because quite often I would go and they would be sent an inf a, a notice that so and so would go, mm -hmm. but they would put just R and my family yeah. name, so they didn't know if it was going to be a woman or a man, and then I came, so. Yeah, thank you, Roberta. Um, well, Chris, I hope that answers your question. Um, it's really interesting to hear more about that aspect of your work. Um, so there's a question um, from Clement to Yuri. So uh, Clement asks, he said, thank you for your presentation. Uh, he said that, Roberta, you made a thought-provoking statement that there is no one truth and could you elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, because truth has to do also with the lived experience. So even though uh, how can you can have events that you think that are facts, but the facts are also tinted with experience. The truth that somebody disappeared mm -hmm. has different impact on different people. So from the point of view of the Truth Commission, when we could go so fine into defining it was somebody who died from human rights violations or a person who died due to um, political violence, at the end for the person mm -hmm. who is surviving, it doesn't matter which it is. So the truth is that it is the consequence, the effect it has. And for us, when we were working, we were very confronted that even to tell a family relative where the body was disposed, even though we said it, it wasn't the full truth for the mother. Mm -hmm. Because once they knew that this, the body had been thrown into the sea, they wanted to know more about that. Mm -hmm. So. It's, it's very complex. It has ethical, legal, emotional co connotations and very much of daily life. Yeah, thank you, Roberta. Uh, hopefully, Clement, that um, has developed that a bit further for you. Um, uh, yes, so, oh, sorry, Christine has just asked for the link. So, uh, Oh yeah, so Christine, the link is in the, the chat there for the current events. So if you click on that, you'll be able to access information about all of the current events, but that includes the Ulster Museum 
and the Queen's Library and also the McGee Campus Library as and well. also some in Catalonia and, and other yeah, things yes so yeah there's uh, exhibitions in Catalonia and exhibitions coming up else, uh, elsewhere in the world next year as well um, so we're at 10 to 12 so we've got a little bit of time if anyone wants to ask anything else so if you have any more questions you can type them in or uh, use the raise hand function and ask them um, otherwise can bring it to a close. Is there anything further you would like to say, Roberta? Well, just thank you for having this conversation and the possibility of showing the layers and inviting you to look at these pieces with a bit of compassion and empathy. And quite often, too, it's been interesting when you see an ambassador looking at it, it, be it becomes very human. My first exhibition of Arpilleras, I wanted it to be in Chilean territory, so we did it in the Chilean embassy in London, mm -hmm. because the women were prosecuted, and then I thought it was a reparation act yes. to have them, even though I couldn't invite the actual women. And it was interesting to see that these people having to come very close, and coming close to people they would not see in ordinary life, from the shanty towns in an embassy. Yes. So we transit different ambience and layers of society, which I find fascinating. They they allow you to be one day in the Tate Gallery mm -hmm. and the other day in a community center, and then another day in front of an event in, in protest. So I think it's the versatile element as yourselves one day you are running and you have your sport gear and then mm -hmm. you go to a party. It's the idea of having these different layers and connotations. And all we think that the person who is making them is feeling, thinking and wanting to tell you something, not only the story, because for them what is most important is the reaction, what you do about that. Not to feel sorry is the most important, is to feel empathy and be invited to act in the way you can, wherever you are, in whatever way you can. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Roberta. They're, they're so powerful. And I think, I mean, I like as a, as a transitional justice researcher, it's, it's so fascinating to see these different ways that people can tell their stories and put them out in the world. Um, I'll just check there's a couple of comments. Um, okay, so everyone is saying thank you. Uh, Christina says the stories of the textiles are very moving. Um, Claire is looking forward to seeing the exhibition. So I don't think there's any further questions coming in. Um, a couple of people are typing, so I'll give it a little minute. And the last thing you can put in the chat is that occasionally I give guided tours at the, at the, at the museum, Ooh. so if they register, I yeah. might give another. For, it, it doesn't have to be more than three or four people, but we have conversations on site. Oh, great, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll add that link in. Um, I'm just checking in. Um, Grace Wilson is recommending the book Threads of Life by Claire Hunter. Do you know it? Yes. yes. <laughs> so yeah, she says she would recommend it to everyone, so that's something for Yeah, awesome. and also I would very much recommend Tapestries of Hope, the Arpillera movement in Chile, 1974 to 1994, yeah. from Marjorie Agosi. Oh yes, yeah. That's the original book, mm -hmm. not the new edition that we launched in Northern Ireland. And there is quite fascinating books by Jacqueline Adams too mm -hmm. on the commercialization and how they went out of the country. Ah, great! Thank you, Roberta. Um, what was the like? Is there some um, is it an event or just the contact us page in relation to tours? Well, they if they write to to me, yeah. they I try to put once every fortnight and come down and meet a group of five six people. Oh, great! Okay, so that to the contact us page on the website which has Roberta's contact details um, and yeah also I would encourage you all just to have a look around so that the, the the website there's a search function you can search you know for depending on where a textile is from or if there's a particular topic of interest and um, obviously it's not as good as seeing them in, in, in real life but um, if you're interested, I would encourage you all to have a look. So thank you so much. For, oh, and when the, if, the, if you go to the Alstom Museum, mm -hmm. take time to also go to Silent Testimony, yep. the paintings by Colin Davidson, because they really speak to what I thought was saying about the empathy 
to the people who have lived the human rights violation. It's not only the agency of what you do to repair, mm -hmm. but how you deal with the pain of the other and how you relate and get involved with respect to that. Yeah, thank you for, for reminding us about that, um, Roberta. So thank you so much, Roberta. Um, it's always fascinating hearing about the textiles and hearing about your, your own experiences as well. So thank you for taking the time and coming down to Belfast. And thank you everyone in our audience for joining us. Um, we realise this is sort of non-traditional setup for this event, but hopefully you're all able to, to follow us well. And um, the event was recorded, so if you have anyone who was interested in coming and, and couldn't make it, it'll, it'll be online and uh, shortly. Remind them to read your article. Oh yes. Um, the blog. Yes, I'll also send you a link to a blog I wrote on conflict textiles. So it has useful links as well to some of the other work that Roberta mentioned, so I'll drop it in the chat as well. So um, this is just a short post I wrote this year, but it contains um, links to some of the other people who have done more sort of substantial in-depth research on, on conflict textiles as well. So thank you everyone uh, for joining us and um, yeah, that's us. Thanks everyone. Goodbye to everybody. Bye. Bye bye. bye.